I recently received a message from the past. It took decades to arrive, lost in a jumble of misinformation and missing information, sitting in a pile of old photos like an encrypted message waiting for the lost cipher. Photographs were an important part of my childhood. My father was a professional photographer, and there were pictures of everything you would expect, like birthdays, holidays, and family gatherings. But we also had a photo record of our everyday life, well before the iPhone era. Grocery shopping, cooking, and other moments of our lives were the subject of many photos. The photos document several decades. This is my father's mother, Golda. Her sister, Henya, stands next to her. And their brother's wife, Boschka, is seated at the left. Sitting at the right is Henya and Golda's mother, Rivka Malka. Rivka Malka's maiden name was Rabinovitz. Golda had an older brother and sister who are not included in this photograph. Golda's father died before she reached her second birthday. At age 12, Golda became an orphan when her mother succumbed to tuberculosis in 1905. Rivka Malka had two siblings to my knowledge, a sister just a couple years older, Golda's aunt Shenachaya, and a younger brother, Golda's uncle Reuben. Because Reuben was 18 years younger than Rivka Malka, it seemed likely there could be other siblings between them of whom I had no knowledge. Reuben left for America before his sister's death in 1905, and his wife and children joined him shortly thereafter. Golda came to America a couple years after her mother died, and her siblings and their families had all left Russia by 1910. My father spoke of Shenachaya in familiar terms. I knew she had made it to America while he was still a child. About 50 years ago, a box of photos joined our huge collection. It came from Golda's house. Many of the photos in the box had been damaged during a leak. The water had marred the images, rendering many of them unrecognizable. Nonetheless, there were dozens that recorded life in another era. This photo, like many others, was printed as a postcard. It shows Golda, her husband Max, and their two-year-old son, my father. It's the earliest group photo of them I've seen. As a kid, I thought my father and his family looked funny in their odd-looking swimwear from the 1920s. I had no interest in the many photos that recorded the marriages of Golda's numerous relatives in New York, and I found the unreadable Cyrillic writing on the oldest photos to be more interesting than the faces of the unknown strangers. Certain photos, like one showing a large family gathering, elicited stories from my father and aunt. It records a pre-travel party for Mr. J. Goldberg in 1930. I could readily spot my grandparents in the photo. With a bit of help, I recognized a much younger version of my father and aunt in the back row. These photos received good care. Some wound up in albums, others hung on the walls of our home, and many remained together in storage in my parents' house. We would ask about some photos intermittently. My sister kept notes as stories were told, and my mother wrote names on the backs of some of the photographs. My father died in 1990. In 2005, when my mother could no longer stay in her house, the box of photos moved to my home. From time to time, I would review them. I translated the backs of photos with Cyrillic text and determined somewhere from the area where my grandfather Max, Golda's husband, was born and lived before emigrating. My brother arranged for a friend to translate the Yiddish script on the back of this postcard. It says it's for my cousin Golda, and that the man on the left named Pesach was just engaged to the woman, Devora, seated at the right, and that Devora's sister stands between them. At least I knew their first names and their relationships to one another, but I still had no idea who these people were. The card is unsigned and bears no date, stamp, or postmark. Perhaps it accompanied a letter. After translating the Cyrillic text on the photos, I began a new search. Where did Golda come from? This map shows Grodno Gubernia, a territory of the Russian Empire. Golda came from Bialystok, a large city famous for the Biali, a flatbread topped with onions. This was a family story. 
There's even a photo of Golda making Bialys at home. Almost all my siblings and cousins recall hearing about Grudno Gubernia, but only half of us recalled the Bialystok part. I decided to look for documentation of Golda's journey to America. The first thing I found were her naturalization papers, which said she was born in Kosovo, Russia. Maybe she was born in Kosovo but grew up in Bialystok. Bialystok is marked in a green oval at the left of the map. Kosovo is marked by the green oval at the right of the map. They're about 75 miles apart if you follow a straight line, or 125 miles if you use modern roads. When I found a ship's manifest showing Golda and her sister-in-law Boschka traveling together to New York, it said their last permanent residence was Kosovo. The final piece of evidence against the Bialystok legend was when I found a record from an 1897 census showing Rivka Malka and Golda living in Kosovo, Russia. It was pretty clear that Golda was born in and spent all her years in Russia in Kosovo, not Bialystok. I learned that the population was just over 3,000 in the 1897 census and that just over 2,000 of that number were Jews. After World War I, Grudno Gubernia became part of Poland, and the name of the town became Kosov Poleski, sometimes shortened to Kosov. Besides that, there wasn't much additional information available. Some time passed, but that group picture from 1930 continued to haunt me. My sister kept telling me she'd written down the names of everyone in the photograph. During a visit in October 2014, I was looking at the picture on my computer and she had her notes. Now we had the names of almost everyone in the photo. This was our Rosetta Stone. I was surprised to learn that Shana Chaya was in the photograph. I didn't realize I'd been looking at her all this time, surrounded by her children and grandchildren. This new information energized me. I looked for any records about Shana Chaya and her children. My sister's notes said that Shenachaya's married name was Vygotsky, spelled as you see it here, starting with a V and containing a T. My sister had only heard it spoken and wrote it phonetically. After a bit of time and searching, I figured out it was actually spelled with a W and a D, as Vygotsky. Even correcting for that error, all I could find was that two of Shenachaya's children had applied for marriage licenses in the 1920s, stating that their mother's maiden name was Ida Rabinovitz. Searching for Ida Rabinovitz or Ida Wigodsky was still a dead end. Other women turned up in the records, but they were born decades too early or too late to be Shana Chaya. I tried to contact some of the people who posted online family trees that included Shana Chaya, although they referred to her as Anna Wigodsky. Some immigrants changed their names many times after arriving in America, so that wasn't surprising. However, looking for Anna Wigodsky also turned up no paper trail, and all my attempts at contacting the owners of these online family trees were unsuccessful. My sister and I speak regularly by telephone. Often we will turn to open family history issues, and without a doubt, Shana Chaya has remained at the top of the list. As I spoke to my sister in October 2015, a full year after the Rosetta Stone moment, I poked around online. I changed one setting in the search criteria, and magically, as I scrolled through the results, I found Shana Chaya Vygotska. This might be her, I thought. It certainly would be the Polish spelling of her name, and the ska ending indicates the feminine form of the family name. I looked at the original document, a ship's manifest from 1925, and yes, it was her. How did I know? Her age was correct. She was traveling to see her son Louis, living at the address I knew to be his at that time. The manifest lists her closest relative in the place she came from, and that person, Esther Bislavsky, was identified as her daughter and living in Kosov, Poland, the same place where Golda was born. I immediately diverted the conversation with my sister to this discovery. Within a minute, my sister raised the same question I was thinking. Did Esther Bislavsky survive World War II? Yad Vashem is the memorial in Israel which has carefully cataloged the Shoah, the Nazi genocide of the Jews in Europe during World War II. Yad Vashem maintains an online database that records the names of millions of victims and the first-person testimonies of their deaths. 
These pages of testimony can be searched and read online in five languages. As I spoke on the phone with my sister, I searched. The database was offline, and we ended the phone call. Just before midnight that same day, I tried the search again. There was Esther Bislavsky, her husband, and three children aged 10, 13, and 16. They were murdered in the Shoah. Esther's maiden name was listed, Vygodsky. She was definitely my grandmother's cousin, just five years older than Golda. They lived in the same village and undoubtedly grew up together. I was certain Golda knew Esther and knew that she was murdered. I was raised with the sense that if any relatives had died in the Shoah, my parents would have told me. The news of Golda's cousin's fate stunned me. Golda died when I was seven years old, and I was her youngest grandchild. I certainly never had a conversation with her about family origins, much less the Shoah. I don't recall asking my parents about this, but two people have very specific, relevant stories. My sister remembers that when she was about 10 years old, she asked our mother whether we lost any family members in the Holocaust. My mother told her no, although my sister recalls a bit of hesitation in the answer. Following their marriage, my mother and father lived in Max and Golda's household for the last 10 months of World War II and for almost another three years after the war ended. Whatever Golda knew of Esther's murder, my mother and father were probably aware of it as well. My eldest cousin's husband directly asked Golda's husband, Max, the same question several years after Golda's death. Max said that no one from the family was a victim of the Holocaust. Maybe Max referred to only his own side of the family, but it seems doubtful that he would have discounted the death of his wife's first cousin. Yes, it sounds improbable that a Jewish family whose origins are in Russia and Poland would not have relatives who were murdered in the Holocaust. My maternal grandmother's family came over in the 1880s. In fact, she was born in America. My maternal grandfather and his parents arrived by 1901. As far as I knew, all my father's family left by 1910. If there were any relatives who remained in Europe, they were perhaps very distant cousins. And of course, some Jews survived the war. When you want to believe something, you can easily convince yourself it's true. As I looked at the Yad Vashem record documenting Esther Bislavsky's murder, I noticed the person who gave the testimony was named Yitzhak Rabinovitz, who was listed as Esther's cousin. Rivka Malka's maiden name was Rabinovitz. If cousin means first cousin, it also indicated that Shane Chaya, Rivka Malka, and Ruben had at least one more brother, and he was Yitzhak's father. I decided to see what other murders were reported in Kosov Polesky. There were 238 names, which seemed like a large number for such a small village. I browsed through them quickly and went to bed. It was after midnight, and I was tired. The next morning I awoke and recalled seeing a man named Pesach on the list. The engaged couple on the postcard were Pesach and Devora. Was this the same Pesach? It's an unusual first name, but it seemed like a long shot. When I returned to the list, I saw that the murdered man who I'd noticed the night before was named Pesach Rabinovitz, and that he was the brother of Yitzhak Rabinovitz. It took a moment to piece together that Pesach was another cousin of Golda's. The Yad Vashem documents also report the murders of Devorah Rabinovitz, Pesach's wife, and their three children, Shana Rivka, age 11, Fival, age 9, and Chanoch, age 7. This is the page of testimony to the murders of Pesach and his three children. Pesach was born in 1898, making him just five years younger than Golda. He was nine years old when Golda left for America. I also learned that Devorah's maiden name was Boratia. I located other photos of people from Kosov Polesky online. My brother was able to match details of the wooden background of our postcard with the online photos and thus confirmed the location of our photo was Kosov Polesky. To my mind, there was no doubt about the location or the identity of the people. Reviewing the records at Yad Vashem, I realized my family tree should include Shenechaya's daughter, Esther Bislavsky, Rivka Malka's brother, Hanoch, and his three children, Yitzhak, Pesach, and a sister named Etel. Of these people, Esther, 
her husband Yosef Bislavsky, and three children, Pesach Rabinovitz, his wife Devorah, and three children, and Etel Kuliszewski and her husband Hirsch were all murdered in the Shoah. In 48 hours, I had found and lost a dozen relatives. Golda had three first cousins who were murdered in the Shoah, and I was holding a postcard with a photo of one of them. The postcard was sent to share the news of a forthcoming marriage, and now, more than 50 years since I first saw the postcard and over 75 years since it was created, I finally knew the true identity of the people in this photograph and its significance to my grandmother. The enigma of the photo was no more. My head was spinning. Yitzhak Rabinovitz gave his testimony to these murders in 1958. He was living in Israel at that time. It seemed improbable that he could be alive, but I figured he probably had descendants, and one of them might want to have this photograph. Through the miracle of the Internet and with the help of someone in Israel, I tracked down Yitzhak's daughter's email address and phone number in under 12 hours. Yitzhak's widow, now over 100 years old, lived in Israel with her daughter. I wrote an email that night. I received a reply the next morning from Yitzhak's daughter, and we spoke that day. Through several phone calls, I learned that Yitzhak had lived on a kibbutz in Poland for a while as part of a training program for new settlers. He arrived in Tel Aviv in May 1939. He had met his wife Chavka on the kibbutz in Poland, but she returned to Łódź and didn't emigrate before the Nazis invaded. After the war, she also came to Mandatory Palestine. Yitzhak was still unmarried. He told Chavka he had been waiting for her. They married in 1945 and had two children. Yitzhak died in 1982, and, very sadly, Chavka died at the age of 102 shortly after I located Yitzhak's family. One other thing became clear in my first phone call with Yitzchak's daughter. Yitzchak hadn't ever told his own children about his brother Pesach, much less that Pesach had been murdered in the Shoah. I have framed the postcard and sent it to them. I made sure that the back of the card is visible and labeled it clearly in Hebrew and English. We have had more phone calls and shared old photos and documents by email. From these, I have learned that Yitzhak, Pesach, and Edel had one more sister named Fruma. She emigrated to Argentina in 1924. There was a photo postcard of Pesach only identified in Spanish as Fruma's brother on the back. Among their family photos was this photo postcard. It matches the one in Golda's box of photos. The photo had traveled from New York to Poland by mail to Argentina, when Froma migrated there in the 1920s, and then to Israel. Yitzhak's children didn't know who the people in this photo were, only that they were Rabinovitz relatives. If I had any lingering doubts, this photo confirmed our family connection. I researched more about Kosov Poleski and learned of its fate. After World War I, the population of Jews declined to 1,473. The Nazis arrived in July 1941. By October, refugees pushed the Jewish population to over 2,200, split across three ghettos. In July 1942, 1,200 Jews were murdered, leaving alive only those who were laborers. Eight days later, partisans drove out the Germans and a few dozen Jews joined the partisans. When the Germans returned, most of the remaining Jews were murdered. In fact, the names listed at Yad Vashem only account for less than one-tenth of the people murdered in Kosov-Poleski. Maybe my parents and grandmother didn't know their relatives had been murdered in the Shoah, but I am skeptical. One of Reuben's great-grandchildren knew some of these details. Yitzhak also kept his own secret of his murdered brother. The pain of the Shoah must have been almost unbearable for those who migrated from Europe before World War II. Maybe not telling of their loss spared them additional anguish. Perhaps they didn't want to burden their own offspring with this painful knowledge. It was also a different era, when people weren't so open about sharing their problems. I make these statements unburdened by the first-hand experiences of those who lived through this awful period. I believe that telling these stories is important— Doing so pays tribute to the lives of those who were murdered. What else did I learn? 
First, write the names of people in photos on the back of paper prints or in captions of digital images. Second, share your entire family history. Happy, sad, and embarrassing events are all important. And finally, don't give up on seemingly impossible research challenges. I have more projects ahead of me. This postcard from Golda's box of photos has nothing written on the back. Do you know anything about this couple?